Welcome to the Deep Dive. Great to be here. Today we're uh, really zooming in. We're looking at one specific vessel profile. Think of it like a ship's ID card. Mm -hmm. And this one's for a container ship called the Salwaz de Incheon. Okay. Our mission really is to see what the hard facts, the numbers, the details about just one ship can tell us about, well, the whole global trade system. Yeah, it's a neat way to ground things. Instead of just shipping, we look at an actual ship, like a case study. Exactly that. So the profile identifies the Saws de Incheon as simply a container ship. Right. And, you know, most people get what that means, moves the big metal boxes. But the details in the profile, they start painting a picture of its specific job. Is it a feeder? A mainline vessel? We start to get clues. Okay, first clue perhaps. It sails under the flag of Marshall Island. The Marshall Islands. <laughs> ah, okay. That's that's interesting. You see flags like the Marshall Islands or maybe Panama, Liberia, mm -hmm. quite often. It's usually what's called a flag of convenience. Well, it means the ship owner registers the vessel in a country that's not their own. Could be for lots of reasons, maybe different tax structures, operational flexibility, sometimes uh, different regulatory environments compared to, say, registering in Germany or Japan. It's a big part of the business side of shipping. Got it. Okay. Let's get a sense of its physical size. The source gives us length overall, 172.07 meters. And the width, the beam, is 27.43 meters. So 172 meters, it's pretty long. Uh, maybe you picture a standard football field end zone to end zone and then add a bit more, significant length. Right. And almost 28 meters wide, that width is key for stability, especially when you're stacking containers high. Those dimensions also sort of uh, limit or dictate which ports and canals it can actually fit into. It gives you hints about its roots. And it's young. Built in 2022, so what, just three years old now? Yeah, very new. In ship years, that's basically fresh off the production line. Oh, right. Which likely means you know, more modern engines, maybe better fuel efficiency built in, perhaps already designed with some future environmental rules in mind. Newer ships often mean, well, fewer headaches early on, lower running costs initially. Okay, now for a really big number. Its dead weight is listed as 22,253 tons. Ah, dead weight tonnage, DWT, that's crucial. Explain that a bit more. It's not the ship's weight itself. Exactly. It's the total weight of everything it can carry besides the ship itself. So cargo, fuel, water, crew, supplies, the whole payload. Yeah. And 22,253 tons, that's that's a lot of carrying capacity. So how much is that, really? Can you put it in perspective? Uh, okay, think about standard shipping containers, the 20-foot mm. ones. This ship could carry something like maybe 1,500 of those, assuming they're loaded. So, yeah, it's essentially a floating warehouse moving a massive amount of goods or value across the water. So putting it all together, yeah. you've got a young three-year-old container ship, medium-sized maybe, flying a Marshall Islands flag, dimensions that suit certain routes, and it can haul over 22,000 tons. Precisely. You start to see a specific profile emerge. It's not one of those enormous mega ships you read about, the ones carrying 20,000 plus containers. No. It's more likely a versatile workhorse, built for efficiency on you know particular trade lanes. Each number, the age, the flag, the size, the DWT tells a piece of its story, its economic function. So this quick look at the Swasti engine, just scratching the surface of its profile, really shows how these specifics matter. We learned it's new, flies that flag of convenience, it's over 170 meters long, and crucially, has that massive 22,000 ton dead weight capacity. Yeah, those details from the source, they give us a concrete picture of this particular vessel. Right. So knowing these very specific things about just one ship, yeah. just the Swazdi Incheon. Yeah. Out of, what, tens of thousands sailing right now? Yeah. What does, considering that one piece, make you think about the incredible scale, the uh, complexity and just the sheer number of moving parts in the global trade network that ultimately brings things to your door? Something to think about. Okay, let's dive in. Welcome everyone. Today we're doing a deep dive focusing on one particular ship, a real workhorse of global trade named the Manet. That's right. We've got some source material here, basically a profile with the key specs for this vessel. And our goal is pretty straightforward. Yeah. Pull out the main facts from the sheet and uh, really understand what kind of ship we're looking at. What do these details actually tell us? Yeah, looking at one ship like the Manet, using these details helps make the huge system of global shipping a bit more, well, tangible. So let's start with the basics from the source. Right, first up, 
it confirms she's a container ship. No surprise there, given the context. And it says she's currently sailing under the Liberian flag. Ah, Liberia. Yeah, for anyone who follows shipping, that's one of the biggest flag states you'll see. So common, right? It really is. And that flag, it determines a lot regulations, labor laws, inspections. Liberia is what's known as a flight of convenience, popular for uh, certain tax structures and its regulatory approach. Interesting how just one detail, the flag, points to all that context. Okay, what about her size? The source gives her length overall as 195.6 meters. Mm, nearly 200 meters, and the width, or beam, is listed as 30.2 meters. So let's picture that nearly two football fields long, maybe a half a football field wide, that gives you a sense of scale. It does, but it also tells you she's not one of those, you know, ultra large container ships, the real giants that are 400 meters long now. So this size, it suggests maybe different routes or different types of ports, she calls out. Exactly, those dimensions, they hint at her job really, perhaps ports with say, length restrictions or routes where you just don't need that enormous scale. Makes sense. And speaking yeah. of her profile, the build year in our source. Who was housing? 2001. Yep. So doing the math, that makes her 24 years old now. Mm. Wow. In a lot of fields, 24 years is well past prime. What does that age mean for a ship like Manit? Well, it really highlights how long these maritime assets last. Ships are built for decades of service. Now, 24 years old, she's definitely not new. Mm. She likely needs quite a bit of ongoing maintenance, might be less fuel efficient than the newer design, sure. But the fact she's still operating, it shows you the long-term investment nature of shipping. Ships this age are still very much productive assets. That's a great point. A huge contrast to something like tech, where things are obsolete much faster. So these things are built to last. Absolutely. Okay, capacity. The source gives us two key figures here. First, deadweight tonnage, DWT. It's 30,442 tons. Yeah, DWT, that's the total weight she can carry. So cargo, fuel, water, crew, everything. Over 30,000 tons is, well, a lot of weight moving across the ocean. It really is. And then the container-specific measure, TEU, 20-foot equivalent units. The source says her capacity is 2,272 TEU. 2,272 standard 20-foot boxes, basically, yeah. or half that number in 40-footers. Over 2,000 containers. Yep. When you actually try to visualize that stacked up, mm -hmm. it really brings home the sheer volume on just one ship. Mm -hmm. And again, like you said about the size, 2,272 TEU. It's significant, yeah. but not like the 20,000 TEU monster, so maybe more regional trade. Or a feeder vessel. Could be. That capacity figure, along with the DWT, it pins down her specific role, her carrying power within that whole global network. Okay, so let's quickly recap what our source of material told us. The Menet. She's a 24-year-old container ship. Flying the Liberian flag. About 195.6 meters long, 30.2 meters wide. And capable of carrying over 30,000 tons dead weight, or 2,272 TEU. So these facts, they came to picture, don't they? A mid-sized, older, but clearly still very active vessel in the fleet. And if you connect these specifics about just one ship back to the bigger picture, well, it tells you something about maritime transport, doesn't it? Even a ship that isn't ultra-large carries a huge amount. Right, the scale is immense regardless. And the fact that a 24-year-old ship is still out there working hard, it really underlines the durability, the long economic life that underpins global trade. These are long-term physical assets. It makes the abstract idea of supply chains feel much more concrete, seeing mm -hmm. the details of one ship like this. Durable, long-serving, moving incredible amounts of stuff. Exactly. Which leads to maybe a final thought for you, the listener, to mull over, based just on these facts we've looked at. Okay. What does the continued operation of a ship like the Manit, 24 years old and still carrying thousands of containers, what does that suggest about the balance in shipping between always building new, bigger, more efficient ships and the uh, fundamental reliability and long-term value that's engineered right into these vessels from the start? Something to think about. Welcome back to The Deep Dive. Today we're doing something a bit different, uh, taking just one source. Just one, yeah, a technical vessel profile. Exactly, and we're gonna sort of dig into what it really tells us. It seems basic, maybe, a snapshot of a ship, but uh, you look closely and it actually reveals quite a bit about you know the mechanics of global trade. Okay, so our mission for this deep dive, let's try and unpack 
the key details on this specific ship, the container ship, Taichung. The Taichung, right. And see if we can get a handle on their significance uh, pretty quickly. Sounds good. So the profile first tells us, well, what she is, a container ship. Right. Sailing under the flag of Panama. Okay, standard enough. But then the first numbers that really jump out are the dimensions, length overall, mm -hmm. 183.21 meters. Mm -hmm. And her width, the beam, is 27.6 meters. Okay, so 183 by about 28 meters. Yeah. Now, for listeners who know vessel types, that already kind of places her, doesn't it? She's not like one of the absolute giants. No, definitely not a ULCV, one of those ultra-large ones, but still a very substantial size. A significant footprint, yeah. And that size, that 183 by 27.6, it um, it suggests something about her role. It points towards flexibility. Flexibility, how so? Well, she can fit through waterways, get into ports that the, uh, the really massive ships just can't access. Ah, okay. So maybe not the huge trans-ocean routes. Often, yeah. yeah. It could indicate she's more on regional routes, maybe feeder services, connecting certain... smaller ports to the big hubs. Right, right. Makes and the great. Panama flag, you mentioned that, it's a major open registry. Tells you it's likely operating internationally, meeting those standards. Got it. Okay, what else? The profile notes she was built in 1999. 1999. So that makes her 26 years old this year. 26 years. In shipping, is that old? Yeah. It's mature, let's say. Not brand new, obviously, but uh, definitely not unusual. Lots of well-maintained ships operate for 25, 30 years, sometimes even more. So it speaks to the lifespan of these assets. Exactly. Huge investments expected to last a long time. Okay, and then crucially for a container ship, deadweight tonnage, DWT. Yeah. It's listed as 24,316 tons. Right, 24,316 DWT. Now that's the total weight she can carry, cargo, fuel, crew, everything. Okay. But combined with her size, you can make a pretty good guess about her container capacity. All right. Uh, probably in the range of, say, 1,700 to maybe 2,000 TU, TU, 20-foot yeah. equivalent units, the standard boxes. Yep. So while DWT is the weight, TU is often more practical for, you know, understanding her actual cargo volume potential day to day. So around 1,700 to 2,000 containers. Still a lot. Oh, absolutely. A real workhorse for certain tradelings, even at that age and size. It's fascinating, isn't it? How these like seemingly dry numbers, mm -hmm. her size, her age, the DWT, the implied TEU count, even the flag, it starts to build a real picture. It really does. You move beyond just seeing big ship. Yeah. You start seeing, okay, this is a vessel with specific capabilities, uh, specific limitations too, because of her size. And she's at a point in her life where, you know, ongoing upkeep is critical to keep her competitive after 26 years. It really highlights that global shipping isn't just about the newest, biggest ships, right? Not at all. It depends on a whole diverse fleet. Ships like the Taichung play a vital role. Okay, so let's just quickly recap the key things we pulled from this one profile on the Taichung. Go for it. Length, 183.21 meters. Okay. Width, 27.6 meters, built back in 1999. Mm, 26 years old now. And a deadweight tonnage of 24,316 tons, which you said likely means. Somewhere around 1,700 to 2,000 TEU capacity, give or take. And what's striking is just how much insight you can get from really just a handful of technical specs. Yeah, it gives you a real sense of the physical scale, the operational life of these assets that uh, basically keep global logistics moving. And these aren't just static things sitting there. They're constantly managed, maintained, routed, pieces of infrastructure that are vital for getting goods around the world. Part of that huge complex system that brings stuff, well, right to you. Right to us. So maybe here's something for you, the listener, to think about. You have this ship, the Taichung, 26 years old, still out there working. Mm. What does that fact alone tell you about the, uh, the durability needed, the sheer amount of investment involved, and the kind of long-term planning that goes into the infrastructure supporting global trade? Yeah, think about that lifespan, that constant effort required just to keep goods flowing across the oceans, eventually reaching your doorstep. It's quite something when you pause to consider it. 